So one of the uh, questions, and I hope I represent those uh, correctly, is the use of natural product as starting points. And the question is, is this really a plausible strategy? Given that you know NCI has a lot of access, we actually do have still an active uh, natural product effort within Novartis. And I think I briefly touched upon it. Uh, one of the things that, that we sh should not underestimate, and Andy Myers is uh, probably a good reference point. I mean, he published a total synthesis of tetracycline and macrolides. Uh, the chemistry is heavily involved because, as I mentioned before, that you might find a natural product. And yes, sometimes we have drugs that were natural products as discovered. But more often than not, you have to fix a few things, maybe a half-life, maybe pharmacokinetic exposure, maybe stability issues. And that typically is heavily chemistry involved. So if you're not willing to invest a lot of chemistry, you're gonna, you're gonna have a hard time. I can also speak from plasmaicin. Uh, it looks very easy on paper. You know, two simple modification on an existing scaffold, but trust me, this was not easy to do. So there are challenges on the synthetic side. The other thing is we have screened a lot of extracts. We changed the way we did collect extracts at Novartis, and we haven't really been very successful, especially in the antibacterial space. Uh, hence my remark to the uh, Muller Hinton broth. I also do believe that if we want to go after natural products, we kind of the low to middle hanging fruit, I think we have discovered. If we really want to go after other things, we have to be willing to invest a pretty substantial amount of resources. And I would suggest to really think about other ways how we screen it. But yeah, I think that's, that, that's good for the natural products. Do you have yep. a question that you would like to address from your left? Do I? I have a question. Do I need to get to the microphone? Good, you can hear me? Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> Lean into your microphone. Andrea. Could you not understand me? Predicted log D versus experimental log D. Yeah, really close to you. Really, really close. close. Okay, very good. <laughs> I hope now you can hear me. Um, question on predicted log D versus experimental log D. Is it good enough? That, I think, is a very good question. Um, and I think the answer depends on what good enough means. What do you need the prediction for? Um, I think log, predicting log D is even more complicated than predicting log P, as you need both the lipophilicity as well as a prediction of your PKA, of your ionization. If you want an order of magnitude, or if you just want to get an idea trends between molecules, this is certainly good. Um, but there's certainly what we found by comparing predicted to experimental values. Um, it depends on the scaffold, it depends on the chemistry, how good your predictions are. I mean, for all of these predictions, um, log D, log P solubility, I think there are efforts on the way to make the predictions better and better and more accurate. Um, and it is always good to know what, what is my error? What, what, how good is my model? And then decide by yourself, is this good enough for my purpose or not? I hope that answers that question. I, I have, I'll address a couple of questions. Uh, one is how small is a small molecule? It's actually a great question, at least for our technology. Uh, then a small molecule is one of approximately 700 molecular weight or lower. It's the definition is really it depends on how much compute time we're willing and able to put to determining confirmations. Uh, vancomycin in our particular system is, is not a small molecule, okay, so that the, our platform is not designed for that. Uh, but, you know, typically things that are going to be in a tablet form, that those seem almost always to work in our system. So that, that's when I say small molecule, knowing that things like vancomycin indeed are considered still small molecules. 
Uh, it's to, that's kind of the definition. I also have seem to have several questions, uh, you know, about yes, the application of AI to studying the accumulation of compounds in the cytoplasm, and also AI to predicting compounds to be efflux pumps. I think that still, you know, this there is not a lot of active work in that field or work that I'm aware of. But I think it's it, the definitely phenomena that to which learning algorithms can be applied. What's needed. Uh, is the training data, okay? And I know that people are beginning to work on systems and develop systems where, in fact, it's really a biophysical experiment where those specific phenomena are being studied. And that would be great direct uh, kind of biochemical, biophysical training data that would enable that kind of an approach. Um, but what can do, and this is some of my other questions too, is that one can make clever use of uh, the, the bacterial constructs that folks have where the different efflux pumps may have been knocked out and looking at differentials in the MIC values, okay, and then you can say, well, look, then th this isn't, there is evidence here, uh, in fact, that a, this particular efflux pump is active uh, against this particular compound. So using that kind of whole cell data uh, is actually another form of training data. And one thing I'd like to say is, using a ligand-based approach, you are able to use data from multiple types, okay? So like when we're trying to learn the images of cats and what constitutes a cat, well, that training data might, you know, it's not just photos, it's photos of more than one cat. It's cats in different poses, and it might be drawings of cats, not just photographs or videos of cats. Okay, you need to be able to learn to use multiple training data sites in order to extract the most value and build those models. And the other, the other question, I think that Heinz made the point, these efflux pumps can be active against a very broad range of substrates. And so that's going to intrinsically be a very, that's going to make it a difficult problem. What's needed is A, the positive training data, but also negative training data. Understanding what compounds aren't effluxed, it's important to give a learning algorithm both of those kinds of examples. Negative data is very, very important. So I... I have another question with a more recent analysis of larger data sets show the physical chemical properties of antibacterial compounds do not differ significantly from drug-like non-antibacterial molecules. I'm only aware of one paper that makes that statement and to the best of my knowledge we looked at that the database used was actually not very good and part of uh, I would refer you to some recent papers published by AstraZeneca and Tasis, uh, which they actually released data on their own experience, which to the best of my knowledge actually very nicely correlate with, with what we published. Uh, I'm not sure where that comment comes from. Maybe it is that paper that I've read, but uh, uh, so I cannot really say more. There is one other question that I got. How do you cope with conformational flexibility in your model building? Uh, is that for you? <laughs> okay. John. So, right, so it just in our, in our approach, okay, you were used, we're generating a four-point pharmacophore, which we, what we do is we determine all low energy conformers. And so that means we're willing to spend 20 minutes per compound doing that computation. And for each and every one of those conformations, we will determine what are the relative juxtapositions of you know, key functional groups, lipophilic moieties, uh, hydrogen bond donors, acceptors, charges, things like that. And so flexibility in that is dealt with explicitly. And then, in fact, all the rotatable bonds are allowed to go through all of their different conformational types so that our goal is to capture all of those low energy conformers. And so compounds can fail because they may be too flexible, and that's one in our particular platform. That is one of the places where it fails. Um, is that answering your question about how we explicitly determine all of those conformations and we allow all of those rotatable bonds to do it? Uh, we, we Rotatable bonds is not a separate parameter that we're using. We're just lo looking at the entire structure of the compound. Yes, yes, we, we, we or them. Okay, that's your question, yeah, we or them. Because in a ligand-based approach, 
you don't necessarily know what is what is the bound confirmation. Okay, and in kind of a hybrid, we are now looking at in cases where you do have co-crystal information, how can you use that to further constrain the confirmers and then the pharmacophore bit key representation to a way that is more representative of the actual bound form, and we are doing that. Good. I, I, I have a question. Is, is there a way to use properties to determine the most useful initial in vitro toxology tests to include? I think that is that is a good qu good question, and toxicology is a field where prediction is is active and ongoing. But I think it is not as straightforward as for many of the other things. For some, like the AIMS test, I think we do understand what structural and molecular properties are likely to really enhance. Um, uh, yeah, enhance possible problems. For example, it's positive nitrogens, uh, charged compounds, etc. Um, but other areas of toxicology, it is not easy to really draw the, dis draw the connection to the molecular properties um, and, and the toxicology. Uh, maybe later on, I'm not sure what exactly the program is this afternoon, but in the preclinical toxicology, um, there might be more information on that. So I have a, a question here about, um, this kind of follows on that question, has there been a meaningful effort to apply AI techniques to safety predictions? And so, yes, so the, that, the suite of models that I, I showed you, actually we're working, I'm sorry, you had a, a, a okay. no, there's some behind you, anyhow, that was your question, yes. Uh, yes, yeah, so that suite of models allows us to predict potential off-targets. And so potential off-target toxicities and effects are, that's the our whole goal, one of our goals in using that, that suite of models. And in fact, it's, we're developing it as a capability for the United States government as we're calling it tox tool. We're also working to integrate it with predictions of PK ADME uh, so that in say, say, not only do we predict a compound will be active against this target, that compound will or will not be able to access the brain or it will distribute in a certain way in order to make a more meaningful prediction of uh, target organ toxicities. But again, that is, uh, that is a work in progress, but it's something that these kinds of approaches applied at scale should enable. Give one more, that's good. Okay, <laughs> last one. Most successful program of Novartis delivered compounds outside the molecular, molecular weight lock D74 space for antibiotics. Uh, I don't know who wrote that question. Are you guys referring to LFF, Clostridium difficile, or what? Who wrote that question, and which <laughs> drug are you referring to? No takers. No takers, because I think it, that's not the correct statement, because, uh, I mean, it still fits the space. It's, you know, a special bug, if that was the one that was meant. I think uh, the question is, how do you, how do you use the calculations to find new antibiotics. And I think both John and I referred to it. John in his talk and I mentioned it, which was, which is basically using to populate archives or in silico space with the with the high probability property space and then use phenotypic screening. Because with phenotypic screenings, you actually address the most difficult things to figure out, which is permeability and efflux. Yes. Well, you need a microphone. It, I think it's impossible to understand you. I just wanted to make a point of clarification about efflux because we've heard it mentioned a lot this morning. Knockouts are not the right tool to use, particularly if you're going forward with AI. We now know, and the efflux field is moving really, really quickly, that if you lose a really big, important membrane protein, such as one of the three in the tripartite system that you've both shown this morning, the impact of that is much more than just on antibiotic susceptibility. If you use a mutant that has loss of efflux function, such as we published last July in MBio, that tells you much more meaningful information. And I'd like to encourage everybody here to stop using gene deletions, knockouts, inactivated genes. You have to use a loss of efflux function mutant. That's going to skew your data if you've not been using it so far. 
That's correct, yeah. And we actually have done, so the other thing that, that really matters is what efflux pump you, you use. And we typically actually, before we do, and we find scaffold different uh, behaviors. We have, for instance, ACRAB, that was another question, often uh, reacts or produces identical data to tall C. Sometimes it does not, so you have to be careful. You're absolutely right. All right, so I'm going to draw us to a close and say thank you to our speakers. Um, and also say to all of you, the, this, this symposium came about because last year a lot of people said they wanted to hear a discussion of med chem details. If this has sparked an idea for you about another symposium you'd like to hear, let me know, let Laura Piddick know, let Ursula Thurzbacher know, because we're, in, we're involved with organizing future sessions like this. And with that, I think it's time for lunch. William is nodding his head up and down. Go forth and eat. Thank you. Thank you.